I'm, I'm most likely you've never heard this before, and I'm, and I'm excited because I really believe that God wants us to step into a kingdom authority and a kingdom power that we've never touched before. And so he has to transform our minds to stop looking at scriptures through a Western lens of 2,000 years later. It's time to go back and see what Jesus was, was communicating to these people during this time. But first, I want to talk about this man because he exemplifies this. This man's name is George Mueller. George Mueller grew up wanting nothing to do with God. He wanted nothing to do with God. And then all of a sudden, someone invites him to a Bible study. He goes to the Bible study because he wants to make fun of Christians. That's why he goes. So he goes to the Bible study, and he's like, man, look, what is this? And he notices something different. All these people really, really love Jesus. All these people really love each other. And he's watching from afar. So he's like, okay, all right. So he comes again. And the next time he comes, God begins to work on the inside of him. And all of a sudden, he gets transformed, on fire for God. He just wants to serve God with all of his heart. And he had this, this vision or this, this thing that God put on his heart for him to be a missionary. And so he came home and he told his dad, and he said, Dad, I want to be a missionary. And his dad was like, well, if you're going to be a missionary, I'm not going to pay for your college tuition anymore. Because missionaries don't make money. So if you want to pay college tuition from me, you better stick to majoring in what you're supposed to major in so you can get a good job. But George knew in his heart, he just knew in his spirit that that wasn't his way, that wasn't his direction. So he trusted God. So he went back, he went back to college and he just trusted God. He didn't have the money to pay tuition. And he decided to do something to him at the time that was really silly. He decided to get on his knees and pray. And he said, God, he said, provide for my college tuition. An hour later, there was a knock on the door. And it was one of his professors. And his professor said, hey, we want to let you know that we have a tutoring position here. And we would like to offer that to you. The tutoring position paid for his entire college tuition. Amen. That was, that was going to get even better. Get even better. I had to share the story. It's going to get even better. That was the day when he realized, okay, there's something up with prayer. There's something up with this, with, with prayer. And so he finishes school, he graduates and all that, and now he feels called to start an orphanage. And so he makes a promise and he makes a decree, I'm going to do every single thing in my life from now on through prayer. I'm not going to ask anybody for anything. I'm going to believe God and I'm going to trust God that he is going to provide through prayer. And so he, he felt called to do his orphanage. He needed a building. So he prayed and he, and he prayed for a building. And God supplies a building for his orphanage paid off. So then he's like, okay, Lord, well, I need, I need help. If I'm going to have kids, I, I, need, I need a staff. So he began to pray and seek God about a staff. God sends people from the north, the south, east, the west, and now he has a staff, and all their needs are taken care of. He begins to pray for supplies, and God brings supernatural supplies to different people. He has everything that he needs. And so later on, and, and as things developed, there was one day where he had 300 kids, and they ran out of food. And the house mom came up to George, and, he said, and, and, and she said, Mr. Mueller, we don't have any food for the kids. What are we going to do? We need to feed them dinner. There's no food. And so George said, have everybody sit down at the tables. Have everyone sit down at the tables. And so everybody sat down at the tables, 300 kids in this cafeteria. They all sit down at the tables, and George is sitting there. And he says, let's pray. And so he prays, and he says, God, I thank you for the food that you are providing in Jesus' name. Within moments, this is recorded, so over 300 people are there. Within moments, there was a knock on the door. Somebody got the door, and it was the baker. And the baker comes in and says, I don't know what's going on. I couldn't sleep all night. I woke up this morning, and I knew God wanted me to bake a bunch of bread for your kids. So he comes in with all this bread. <laughs> so someone goes to the door, and it's the milkman at the door. Goes to the door, and it's the milkman at the door. And they look outside, they, they realize that the milkman's cart broke down in front of the orphanage. The milkman was just going on his way, and his cart just happens to break down right in front of the orphanage. And so he comes in and he says, I, I don't know what to do with all this milk. It's, it's going to spoil, so I might as well give it to you guys. So at the same time he prayed for bread, the same time he prayed, bread came in and milk came in, and it was enough milk for all the kids. 
This is the type of miracles that he would begin to see. And 165 years later, today, he graduated over 10,000 kids. 10,000 kids, never asking anybody for nothing. And every time somebody would leave, someone would leave his house, he would always give them a Bible, and he would always give them a quarter. And he would say, look, if you can hold on to the Bible, you'll never have to worry about anything. Hold on to this Bible. And he would pray for them and release them. Over 10,000 kids from that legacy. Come on now. That's what I I want you to forget that because I want your faith. Our faith today is going to go to another level with prayer. You see, many of us don't pray because we don't understand the power that we have. George Mueller knew something that many of us do not know today. He knew about the keys to answer prayer. He knew the keys to answer prayer. You see, just because you're a believer doesn't mean you understand the keys to answer prayer. Many of us are carrying the keys, but we never use it. But George was using the keys. And I really believe that God is saying it is time for my people to start using the keys that I've already given them. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, Matthew 16, 19, my goal today, as we read this again, I want, our goal today is to understand the kingdom significance of, behind these words. Okay? Because this is not a religious thing that Jesus is about to say. This is a kingdom thing. And if you are of a kingdom mind, you understand it. If you're not of a kingdom mind and you're, and you're, on, you're of a religious mind, you know, you're not going to get it. So this is what Jesus says. I'm going to read it one more time. Matthew 16, 19. So Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, and also I say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. Now, when I found this out, this really, like, really blew my mind, and I'm so glad I learned this, and I'm excited to teach you this today. Notice that Jesus didn't say, I will build a church, like it was the first church. Notice that Jesus didn't say, I will build the church, like this is, the, I'm going to create a church. No one's never seen this before, I'm going to create a church. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. There was no questions from the disciples. No one said, well, what is a church, Jesus? Because they already knew. Church had already been a term that people used for hundreds of years up to that point. This was nothing new. Jesus was making a statement saying, the time has come for me to build my church. Not the church, but my church. You see, church comes from the, from the Greek word called ekklesia. Everyone say ekklesia. They have been using this term for hundreds of years, ecclesia, and ecclesia was not a religious word. It was not a spiritual word. It was a political word. It was actually a governmental word, ecclesia. It was a kingdom word. So the Greeks used this, and it describes a group of citizens that are called out. I mean, say called out. Called out. A group of citizens that are called out for governmental purposes. I'm gonna say it again. Ecclesia means a group of citizens. Citizens, not just anybody. A group of citizens that are called out by the king for governmental purposes. Ecclesia. Later on, the Romans adopt this idea of an ecclesia. And many people know it today in modern times as a cabinet. You know, a cabinet, people are appointed to a cabinet. They're not voted in. This is an ecclesia. These are confidants of, of people in high positions, the confidants of the king, his ecclesia, his inner court. It's the people that come, they have access to, to the king like, no other, like nobody else. Not only do they have access, but they have status, they have authority, they have power to say things and speak things and to talk about different matters, and the king backs them up. The kingdom backs them up. And so the heart of the Roman Empire was the ecclesia. So during this time, Jesus comes during the Roman Empire. All his disciples are here under the Roman rule. So they, have, they know exactly what an ecclesia is. They know exactly what he's talking about. 
When he says, I'm going to build my church, they're like, oh my goodness, because Caesar already has his church. So Jesus is saying, basically, I am a king, and I'm building my church. And this is how my church is going to run. This is how my, this is how we, what we're going to do in my church. And so this is an exciting thing. That's why they thought that Jesus was about to rule right there. They're like, oh my God, you're about to kill all the Romans. He's about to build his church. We're about to, we're about to do this. They start, they start asking questions. They start having debates. So, so Jesus, can I sit on your right and your left? We, like, who can sit on your right and your left? Like, they're, they're trying to get it. They don't understand that. They think it's like the Roman embassy. They don't understand that this is the kingdom of heaven embassy. They, they, they're trying to wrap their minds around it. You know, Peter's cutting people's ears off when they're coming to get Jesus. Like, they're, they're ready to fight. Like, they, they think it's the Romans. They think they're supposed to fight in war, and that's not what Jesus is talking about. This is a new kingdom that Jesus is restoring. Because to be honest with you, the ecclesia first started in the book of Genesis. Whew. The, book of, the, 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 the first ecclesia wasn't even with the disciples and Jesus 2,000 years ago. It was actually with Adam and Eve. That was the first ecclesia. That was the first people that were called out and appointed to do the work of the king. All right, I'm getting ahead of myself. Here we go. Let's get this. Are you guys learning something? Yeah. Woo! When we understand it's like looking at this from a religious view, your prayer life is going to go to another level. You see, these disciples have so much confidence. Well, they have so much confidence. Get up and walk. And they just walk away and the person get up and walk. They had so much confidence because they knew their position in the kingdom. And I'm just saying, like, if we can understand our position in the kingdom and stop being just like a Sunday, if we can just we can we can move on and understand what the ecclesia actually really is. The ecclesia is not a one day a week thing. It isn't. It, the ecclesia is not an hour and a half service. An ecclesia is not a building. An ecclesia are the people who are appointed and called out. And that's why I have an issue when churches compete with one another. That's why I have an issue when people rep churches like they're gangs. <laughs> because we're all of the same people. We're all called out. We're all a part of the ecclesia, no matter where you are around the world, no matter what church you go to, no matter what age, no matter your ethnicity, your background, we are all a part of God's chosen people, Amen. called out for his purposes. Amen. So this is why you want to have faith that you need to start praying, like, now, about everything. So I want to go back. We're going to go to Matthew 16, 13. I want to go a little, go a little back because I want to show you this. There, and this will make more sense to you if you've read this before, you've heard this before. Because Peter has a revelation, and then Jesus goes, goes on about the revelation that Peter has. So it says, when Jesus came into the region, awesome. When Jesus came into the region, the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And so they said, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? <laughs> so Peter speaks up, because Peter knows. Peter knows exactly who he is. He said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. When we see this, we're just thinking, oh, okay, he knows Jesus is the son of God. It's more than that. He's, he's saying, you are the, the, the Christ. You are the anointed one. You, you're the king. You are the king of kings. You're the one that's supposed to come back and, and restore us. You're the king, Jesus. You're the king. And so Jesus says, oh, you know who I am. You know who I am. You know I'm the king. I know Caesar's here. I know we're under Caesar, but you know I'm the king. So Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I'm going to say to you that you are now Peter, which means stone. And on this rock, this rock he's talking about, revelation. On the revelation that I am the king of kings, that I am the lord of lords, that I am restoring my kingdom. On this revelation, Peter, I am going to build my church. You see, because you understand I'm king, you understand that I'm going to bring my own church, my own ecclesia. And so now he takes it to the next level. So now Jesus says, I want you to know who you are. So now you can do this. You can do this. He says, I, actually the most important thing, I just can't skip that. He, said, he says, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The gates of Hades means death, the grave. Meaning that this is a kingdom that will never die. 
You see, you can be a part of the Roman Empire, but eventually you're going to die. Eventually the Roman Empire is going to die. But my kingdom is never going to die. So death can't even stop it. So let me give you another revelation about the ecclesia. Let me tell you what they would do. So powerful. This is why his disciples got it. No one asked any questions. They just they knew what he was talking about. Because he Jesus was very relative. Jesus always would connect things to time, to modern times so people can understand what he's saying. Just like today, we're supposed to connect things to modern times and so people can understand of our day, right? Jesus did the same thing. So he, Jesus is trying, Jesus knows that they're gonna get it. So, so the ecclesia also, what they would do is they had special access to come and sit down where the king was by his throne. And they would, they, would, they would sit around the king and all they would do is listen and take notes of what the king would say. They would basically would be just hearing his word. They would just listen to the word of the king. And so they would write down his thoughts. They would write down his desires. They would write down his will. And the job of the ex ecclesia, the people who were the citizens of this group, their job was to partner up with the governor the governor of each state. Our governor is the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 They would partner up with the governor and execute the will of the king across the kingdom. That was their job. Isn't that powerful? Yes. So, whatever they would say, the kingdom would back them up. Whatever they would say, the kingdom would back them up. So when Jesus is about to explain the role of his disciples, they're really going to be excited. They're going to be like, oh my goodness, really? We're, this, is, this is amazing. So he says to them, he says, and I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And he says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So what this did for the disciples, it created a confidence. Everyone say confidence. confidence. That what I say what I do, as long as, as long as it's a part of God's will, the king's will, it's my job to see his will executed. So if I pray his will, of course he's going to back me up. Because he wants, my, he wants his will to be executed on the earth. That's why if you understand the power of prayer, this can change your life. All you have to do is connect with his will, and everything that you speak from his will, Kevin's going to back you up. If you don't believe me, 1 first, first John 5, 14. It says it like this. We talked about it last week, but this is maybe you'll look at it a little differently. First John 5 14. This is why we have to pray. And this is why the enemy is so afraid of us pray, uh, having to understand the power of prayer. First John 5 14. This is what happens. This is what happens when you are connected to the King. Connected to the King, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Get this, get this, get this. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him. Because the reason why there's a confidence is because you've been sitting at the feet of Jesus. You've been reading his word. You've been, you, you've been reading his word. You've been, you, you, you have time. You, you, you have some time to, to connect with the king. How are you, you going to execute his will if you don't know his will? So there's a confidence. He says, this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything, anything according to his will. You see, what happens is, is that as you're abiding in Jesus, and Jesus is abiding in you, like it says in John. He says, ask what you, shall, ask what you desire, it shall be given to you. Because what happens is that as you are delighting in him, he says, I will give you the desires of your heart. Because there is a oneness. You start understanding what he wants. You start understanding, you know, his character. You know, I've been married now for eight years. Woo! Yeah. And so, by now, <laughs> I understand my, my wife's desires. I understand her heart. I understand what she likes. I understand what she doesn't like. I know what annoys her. <laughs> I know what frustrates her, but I also know what makes her happy. I know these things. I know her will. And so because I already know her will, I know if I ask certain things, I know she's going to back it up because I know her. I know, I know her. What I'm getting at is, is this is a relationship with God. This is a marriage relationship with the Father, with God. And as you begin to know his heart for your life, you'll know what to pray. 
You'll know how to pray. God will begin to give you visions. He'll begin to give you dreams. He'll start giving you desires for things that you just put away a long time ago. He'll start giving you a desire that you buried and it's under the ground. You're like, God, I'm insecure now. I don't know. I can't do that. It's been so long. God will start call, like calling things back up in your life. And you'll know it's him. And all he is waiting for you to do is just pray. All he's waiting for you to do is just ask. And as the king, as because you are part of his ecclesia, he wants to back you up. Amen? Amen? Verse 15, it says, And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions of the things that we ask of him. Let me, let me say this. If you do not know his word, you will not know his will. The fruitfulness of your prayer life is connected to your word life. I'll say it again. The fruitfulness of your prayer life, because you don't know what to pray, right? So in order for your prayer life to be fruitful, you have to know what to pray and how to pray. And it is connected to your word life. It is connected to you understanding the will of God. There's certain things that we don't pray for and ask for, we feel guilty about it, but we don't understand that's God's will. There's, there's, because of our ignorance, we are literally, people have died on this earth from ignorance, stood before God, and God was like, I can heal you. I could have healed you. But we didn't know. We didn't know. We don't know. Listen, you want to know the will of the king so that you can fulfill every assignment that you have on this earth. We need to seek him out. We need to understand our calling and what he's calling us to do. And then when we understand that, we'll start being way more effective. Amen? Amen. Amen. So Jesus says, I'm giving you the keys to access heaven's back. I'm going to let you know this, the next point. An entire kingdom wants to back you up when you pray. An entire kingdom wants to back you up when you pray. Know that when you pray, it is not just hitting the ceiling. Know that when you pray, it's not falling on blind ears. Scared of deaf ears, sorry. Blind eyes, deaf ears. <laughs> know that when you pray, something is happening. Things are being moved. Things are going. I want to encourage you the things that you have been praying for, you better keep Praying. You better keep declaring. You better keep speaking. Although you may not see the evidence that anything is changing, it doesn't matter, and I'm about to explain why. You better keep praying. Amen? Amen. 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 So, I want to talk about some of the keys. I want to talk about some of the keys. Who wants to know the keys? i got to talk about the key, because the disciples understood this key. And that's the reason why we see so many things with them. And I, I, I see people today that are operating on different levels of faith. And, you know, when I, when I research them and, and I study, I, I find out that they understand these keys. They, 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 they get the keys. George Mueller understood the keys. The first key that I want you to know, and I said this last week, but it's so important. And I'm going to explain it in a different way. The first key that Jesus has given you is the key of righteousness. Righteousness. Everyone say righteousness. righteousness. Here's something, here's a different spin on it. Righteousness obviously means, well, some of us know, means right standing with God. We have right standing with God because of what Jesus did for us. He wiped our slate clean. And now it is not by works. It is not by effort. It is not how well I can perform. I cannot earn my position in his kingdom. It has been given to me free. It is for free, and it is through grace. It is through grace and faith that I stand in this position with Jesus. When I stand before him, I didn't earn my way there. I just received, I, I received my way there. You don't earn your way. You receive your way. You receive him first, and then you're able to love him back. Many of us have been trying to love him first without receiving anything, and we keep falling time after time again because we're doing it on our own strength. God says, let me allow, allow me to love you first. After you receive my love and you're filled up with my love, then you're able to do the thing that I've called you to do. Amen. That is righteousness. Righteousness. Some of us have a hard time receiving. But if you have a hard time receiving, you're going to have a hard time doing. So God is saying, I need you to learn how to receive my love. I know that sometimes it's uncomfortable. I get it. But God is saying, Res receive my love. Receive it. When you receive this love, then you understand that you, you begin to walk in a righteousness. Righteousness is both um, a family position and political position. This is what the disciples knew. The ecclesia. 
The ecclesia is both family and it's both and it's both uh, kingdom. So your family position and righteousness is that you are a prince or a princess of the Most High God. That is who you are. You are royalty. You are literally royalty. And the second thing is that you are a citizen of the kingdom. You're a citizen of the kingdom. Jesus takes it a step further. He says, you're not just a citizen of the kingdom. You're a part of my ecclesia. You're a part of my inner circle. You're an ambassador. You, 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 this, is, this is your position in the kingdom. There's an authority you have to speak and say things and things happen. So, so you're not just a, a, a daughter or a child of the king. You're related to the king. You're his kid. But you also have a position outside of that as well. I mean, my goodness. What more do you need to pray? <laughs> what more do you need to pray? I remember I had this dream, um, and I, I knew that I knew that I knew in my spirit that the world was over. I'm not trying to scare you. <laughs> but I knew that the world had ended, and I knew it just ended. And we were all, and, and I remember being in this big room. It was like, kind of like, it was like a, a huge ballroom. It was like a ballroom, a huge ballroom. And I remember people were dancing, and it was a big circle. And I knew that I knew that I knew in this dream, and I was dancing too, everyone was wearing like these type of medieval times clothes. And I remember we were all doing this dance, and I remember on the outside of all the people were angels, and they were all watching. And, the, and I, I knew in this dream that the sons and the daughters of the king were dancing. And Jesus was sitting on the throne, and he was watching this entire thing. We were dancing for him, and it was a coming home party. It was like our first day there, and everyone was dancing. And I remember dancing, and I remember doing this move. I, I knew all the dancers, I don't know, you know. And I was like, hey, let's go. And I remember making eye contact with him. And I remember him nodding his head. And so I want you to know that you are not just, a, 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 you know, someone who is saved, who knows Jesus. You are his daughter. You are his son. And, and, and you are royalty. You are literally royalty. Angels look at you as royalty. We are royalty before God. So the power that you release, heaven takes it very seriously. Amen? Amen. Amen. So everyone say saying righteousness. righteousness. James 5.16 says, The prayer of a righteous person availeth much. When you pray, you have to pray out of your position. Don't pray as from being a stranger. Don't pray from being unworthy. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been. All you have to do is repent before the Lord. All you have to do is say, God, I dropped the ball. Here I am. And you begin to take your place because you are the righteousness of God. That never changes. You are the righteousness of God. Amen? Amen. I want to look at somebody who, um, who, had this, who had this key. I want to look at this real quick. This is Elijah. Let's go to James 5.17. James 5.17. This is Elijah. Elijah understood his position in the kingdom. He understood who he was, and he understood the keys. He understood the keys that he needed to get his prayers answered. I want you to look at this type of boldness he operates in, because I really believe God is calling us to the same boldness. This is, this is, this is James 5.17. It says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly. I want to stop right there. This man that we're about to read about, he is just like you and me. But he knows something that many of us do not know. He knows his identity. Amen. You see, what I'm talking about right now, and I've been trying to talk about, is something called identity. When you understand your identity as a child of God and as a citizen of the kingdom, your prayer life changes. Your prayer life becomes bolder. You start praying for things that are impossible. You start praying for things that just, I mean, it takes a lot of faith to pray for. But the reason why is because you understand your identity. Many of us have been holding back from things, thinking that this is too impossible or, or this is too big. And how am I going to do this? And it's because we're lacking in the area of our identity. He knew his identity. So he says that he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. How is somebody going to have the audacity to pray that it doesn't rain? And it actually doesn't rain for three years. And he was doing this for a reason. There was, a, there was an evil rulership in Israel. He was doing this for a reason. Let me tell you what Elijah did. 
Uh, this wasn't Elijah's idea. Elijah was a part of the ecclesia. He sat down with the king. And as he sat down with the king, the king gave him the desire. The king gave him the word to execute his will on the earth. So when he prayed, he prayed with an authority. He prayed with the boldness because he knew he was doing the exact same thing that the king commissioned him to do. When you take your position as a child of God, you don't just start praying and you don't know what's going on. You pray with authority because you know God has commissioned you to do it. You know the king has given you orders to pray for your family. You know, you know the king has given you an assignment with different people. You know that, that the king has given you an assignment for different sectors of our world, different industries where you're called to be. There's a territory, there's a dominion. Dominion, which is ecclesia. He said, he said, take dominion over the earth. Take dominion, rulership, that's ecclesia. You are a ruler, you, you are a king's kid. So that when you pray, you pray with authority. You don't pray with weakness. You don't pray with fear. You don't pray with timidity. You don't pray with, with, with that. You pray with boldness and power. And Elijah understood who he was because he had time to sit down with the king. Amen. And then it says, he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Woo. I want to go here real quick. about to close soon. <clears throat> How you guys doing? Just you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Two other keys. So the first key is righteousness. <clears throat> the second key is faith. The second key is faith. And this is what God began to show me in my time of study. He said that you cannot have the faith that I want you to walk in if you do not understand the first key. If you do not understand that you are righteous, there's no way you can operate in this level of faith. You have to first understand, that's why God has to take a season where he's just trying to give you the first key. He's just trying to groom you, trying to just make sure that, okay, you're here. So, so you can understand, so you can move the second key. You see, Elijah was able to access the key of faith because he had already stepped into the key of righteousness. He knew who he was as a part of the ecclesia. So the next key for us is faith. Faith, everyone say faith. faith. And the next key is humility. Woo! Humility. Do you know that Lucifer lost his position in heaven? He had a position in the kingdom, a high position, and lost his position because of pride. That means pride is the only thing that can cause us to lose our position. It says this, it says, it says this is what it says about pride. It says in James 4, 6, it says, God resists the proud, but gives grace. Meaning as a king, he listens. He gives his time to hear your prayer. He gives his time to listen to you. It says that he gives grace to the humble. To the humble. So the first key is righteousness. The second key is faith. And the third key is humility. Amen? Amen. But I want to give you some good news. Because some of us can really work on these areas. And God, I want to be more humble. But Jesus actually makes it very easy. He actually sums it up. And he makes it very easy to get all the keys. He makes it very easy. Matthew 6, 33. Look what it says. We know the scripture. He says, listen, I know, I, I, know, I know everyone is always trying to work on themselves. I got to work on myself, and I got to improve this in my life. And we start thinking about, everyone's thinking right now, God, I need to do this better. I need to work on this. I need to practice this. And Jesus sums it up because he doesn't want you to think about anything else but him. He says, sum it up like this. How about you just do this? I know there's all these keys, but just focus on the first key. Just see first the kingdom and my righteousness, and I'll add everything to you. That's right. And so as you pursue Jesus, he instills you with all the keys. Now, you, you have faith because you have love, because you have confidence. Now, you, you know, there, there is a humility. He teaches you humility. He gives you the keys as you seek first the kingdom. All he wants you to do is just go after him with all your heart. And he said, I'll add everything to you. I want to close with this. I'm going to close with this last thing. Because you can still have the keys. And you can still operate in the keys. But that doesn't mean that you're going to get what you want when you want it. Three different types of form of delay. I'm going to talk about something called delay. I won't say delay. delay. I don't think anybody likes that word. <laughs> Especially at the airport. 
delay, delay, delay. Three different types of delay. I want to close out on The first type of delay happens. You're praying, you're praying in faith, you know who your father is, you're a citizen, you, you know all that, and it's still not happening, it's still not here. It's something that you've been leaving for, that you're calling God out for. The first uh, delay is the delay that happens. Remember what I'm saying? The delay that happens from spiritual immaturity. Spiritual immaturity. I've shared this story, but it's been a while. It is very funny to me. I was believing for a TV show. Then our, we, we have a, we're you know, producers and we're in the industry and stuff. And so there was this TV show idea that we had and we, we pitched it and people were getting interested and it just kept hitting these walls and it just didn't make any sense. People were like, yeah, we want to do it. And then we wouldn't hear back from them. It was just all this weird stuff and it was so discouraging. But I didn't understand because God gave me the vision to do it in the first place. As a part of this ecclesia, God gave me the vision for the show. So I knew this was his will. I knew it, but I didn't understand why the delay, why the delay. And so we went, I, I would, we were radical about it. I'm like, I need answers now. So I fasted. We didn't just fast food, we fasted water. I'm like, I need to know from you right now what's going on. Like, I, I, was, I, was, I was mad. I was mad. I said, God, I want it face to face. So that night, <laughs> just be careful what you're asking for. <laughs> that night, I had a dream. And uh, I was actually at a church, and there was a man on the stage. I knew with all my heart it was Jesus. I knew it was Jesus. As soon as I saw him, I said, that's Jesus right there. He started walking towards me. So I'm on this side of the stage, he's on this side of the stage. And I'm on the floor, like on my knees like this. He starts walking across the stage, and he's coming up to me. He comes up to me, he looks me right in my eyes, and he says, you are not ready. And he stood there. I was like, <clears throat> I woke up. I was like, hey. <laughs> I was like, you know, that's, I mean, you couldn't tell me in another way. I mean, man. I was like, I was happy because I knew the answer, but I was still like, I was like, hey, that's, that's kind of cold, man. Like, how about you love me? How you gonna tell me like that? But you know what? That is exactly. When I look back, that was three years ago, when I look back on that, that's exactly what I needed to hear. You see, that is a daddy. That's a daddy that loves you. He loves you to give you truth. He loves you. He loves to tell you what's going on. That is a real parent. He's not going to just tell you, oh, I love, I love, I love. No, no, no. He is your parent. He loves you, and he will protect you to do whatever he has to do to do it. All you need to do is just seek his will. Just seek his face, and he'll let you know. And so three years later, the same show that I wasn't ready for, it got picked up. And, you know, God is using the show, right? So God is so good. And, 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 and so that's the first part of delay. Everyone say delay. delay. Spiritual maturity. De the next part of delay is disobedience. I know people want to hear that. Do you know that because of disobedience, you can keep doors shut? Doesn't matter if you have the key. You can put the key in, it ain't gonna work. The lock has been changed. <laughs> Disobedience. God has instructed you to do something that you are not doing. He keeps telling you and telling you and telling you. And the reason why he's telling you is because he's giving you the power to do it. He's not gonna tell you something that you can't do. So when he gives you something on your heart, it can be small, it can be big, it can be, it can be a diet, it can be <laughs> the Lord's been speaking to me about it. Um, it, it can be all, it can be anything, but whatever the Holy Spirit has been putting on your heart, he's, he's trying to set you up for the next season, but he can't release the next season until you obey his word. So disobedience is another reason for delay. The, the children of Israel, I mean, how many years did it take them? 40. 40 years to get into the promised land. Delay, 40 year delay because of disobedience. So spiritual maturity, we're just not ready enough. The next thing is, and God is developing you to be ready. The next thing is, is disobedience. But the third thing, the third thing is spiritual warfare. I'm going to close with this. Let's go to Daniel 10. Daniel 10, 12 through 13. This is really going to encourage you to keep praying. To not give up. Because you need to understand what's going on in the spiritual realm. Daniel 10, 12. And it's 11, 12. Yeah. Um, 
Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand, oh, he used one of the keys, and to, Humble. say it aloud, say it aloud. Humble. Oh, he used one of the keys. He has all the keys. He did, I mean, he, he knows who he is in the kingdom. He knows he's righteous. He knows he's a citizen. He, he, he is obviously in faith. But the third key is, and this is the third key that catches the ear of God, is humility. Humility. When we humble ourselves, you know, George Mueller got down on his knees. It was silly, but it was humility. And as he humbled himself before God, his prayers were heard. Humility. So he says, humble yourself before your God. He said, when you humble yourself before your God, what happens next? Your words were heard. And this is what the angel says. He says, I have come because of your words. When you pray, angels are released because of your words. A lot of people's angels are bored. <laughs> They're just standing around like, can I come back up there please? I don't know. I'm not doing anything down there. Pray. Use your angels. They move to and fro. It's a real thing. It is real. Real, real, real. Pray, please. Yeah. Use your angels. But if angels can be released by your words, so can demons. Demons can be released from your words as well. That's what we guard what we say when we, we pray. So this is what happens. He says, but the prince of Persia, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia. You see, this is a kingdom situation. It's a kingdom matter. Daniel is of the kingdom of heaven. He has his position. Angels are being released because he's of the kingdom. But there's another kingdom that is trying to stop him. It says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. You know what this means? This means that Daniel, as soon as he prayed, God answered his prayer. But the prayer took, but the answered prayer took 21 days to come to Daniel. That's right. What happens if Daniel gives up on the 20th day? What happens when Daniel says, it's not working? It's not working on the 20th day. I guarantee you, he would not have this encounter with this angel. I guarantee you, it would have been over. What things are we praying for that the enemy is trying to give up, get, get us to give up on? That is about to get here any moment. Can you guys stand here, Fini? Mm. You see, a lot of us have been fighting, 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 fighting. But it's not your job to fight, it's your job to pray. Amen. Angels fight. You pray. As a son, as a prince, and a princess in the kingdom, imagine walking around the palace, and you have servants at your sides. You have security at your side. That's what, that's what it looks like in the spiritual realm. You have servants at your side. You have, you have guards right by you. And whatever you ask, they, they do, if it's according to his will. They will do anything according to his will. And so God is saying, it is time for my people to use the power and authority. Come on, who's been blessed by this message today? Who's been blessed by this message? Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. I pray right now that people receive this. I pray that this changes lives. That, like, this is a message that's not, oh, that's just a good, that's a good message. No, this is a transformation, life-changing message. I pray that it yields fruit a hundredfold in people's lives, that they begin to take their positions as children of God, as citizens of the kingdom, a part of an ecclesia that is, that is connected to the kingdom of all kingdoms, to the king of all kings, to the Lord of all lords, Jesus, the kingdom of heaven. I thank you that that is our position, and, and we're here on this earth for a reason. We're here to influence. We're here to impact. We're not here to judge people. We're not here to go off on people. We're not here to get into to wars on Facebook. We're not here to go off on people on Instagram. Uh, we're here to represent the kingdom. The kingdom of love, the kingdom of power, and the kingdom of a sound mind. We thank you, Lord God. 
In Jesus' mighty name. Father, we thank you for hunger. Bless the people here today who never made a decision to, to, to receive Jesus and receive your righteousness. You can do so right now. All you got to do is say, Jesus, I receive my righteousness. I receive what you did for me. I receive it in my heart. And that's all you have to do. In Jesus' mighty name. If this blessed you, can we give a praise to the Lord?